From Plasse to Partition Chapter 5 Early Nationalism, Discontent and Dissension The Moderates and Economic Nationalism Congress politics during the first 20 years of its history is roughly referred to as moderate politics. Congress at that time was hardly a full-fledged political party. It was more in the nature of an annual conference, which deliberated and adopted resolutions during the three-day tamashas and then dispersed. Its members were mostly part-time politicians, who were successful professionals in their personal lives a thoroughly anglicized upper class who had very little time and commitment for full-time politics. There had been some distinct phases in moderate politics, but on the whole, there was an overall uniformity in their objectives and methods of agitation. The moderates were primarily influenced by utilitarian theories, as Edmund Burke, John Stuart Mill and John Moller had left a mark on their thoughts and actions. The government should be guided by expediency they believed, and not by any moral or ethical laws. And the constitution was to be considered inviolable and hence repeatedly they appealed to the British Parliament complaining about the government of India subverting the constitution. They did not demand equality, which seemed to be a rather abstract idea. They equated liberty with class privilege and wanted gradual or piecemeal reforms. British rule to most of them seemed to be an act of providence destined to bring in modernization. Indians needed some time to prepare themselves for self-government, in the meanwhile, absolute faith could be placed in British Parliament and the people. Their complaint was only against un-British rule in India perpetrated by the Viceroy, his Executive Council and the Anglo-Indian bureaucracy, an imperfection that could be reformed or rectified through gentle persuasion. Their politics, in other words, was very limited in terms of goals and methods. They were secular in their attitudes, though not always forthright enough to rise above their sectarian interests. They were conscious of the exploitative nature of British rule, but wanted its reform, not expulsion. As Dada Bhai Noroji, one of the early stalwarts of this politics, put it in 1871, in my belief a greater calamity would not befall India than for England to go away and leave her to herself. Therefore, within the constitutional field, the moderate politicians never visualized a clinical separation from the British Empire. What they wanted was only limited self-government within the imperial framework. They wanted first of all the abolition of the India Council which prevented the Secretary of State from initiating liberal policies in India. They also wanted to broaden Indian participation in legislatures through an expansion of the central and provincial legislatures by introducing 50% elected representation from local bodies, chambers of commerce, universities, etc. They also wanted new councils for northwestern provinces and Punjab and to Indian members in the Viceroy's Executive Council and one such member in each of the Executive Councils of Bombay and Madras. The budget should be referred to the legislature, which should have the right to discuss and vote on it and also the right of interpolation. There should also be a right to appeal to the Standing Committee of the House of Commons against the Government of India. Thus their immediate demand was not for full self-government or democracy, they demanded democratic rights only for the educated members of the Indian society who would substitute for the masses. The expectation of the moderate politicians was that full political freedom would come gradually and India would be ultimately given the self-governing right like those enjoyed by the other colonies as Canada or Australia. With an intrinsic faith in the providential nature of British rule in India, they hoped that one day they would be recognized as partners and not subordinates in the affairs of the empire and be given the rights of full British citizenship. What they received in return However, was Lord Gross's Act or the Indian Council's Amendment Act of 1892, which only provided for marginal expansion of the legislative councils both at the centre and the provinces. These councils were actually to be constituted through selection rather than election. The local bodies would send their nominees from among whom the viceroy at the centre and the governors at the provinces would select the members of the legislative councils. The budget was to be discussed in the legislatures, but not to be voted on. 
the opposition could not bring in any resolution nor demand a vote on any resolution proposed by the government the government of india was given the power to legislate without even referring to the legislatures whose functions would be at best recommendatory and not mandatory very few of the constitutional demands of the moderates it seems were fulfilled by this act so far as the reformation of the administrative system was concerned the first demand of the moderates was for the indianization of the services an indianized civil service would be more responsive to the indian needs they argued it would stop the drainage of money which was annually expatriated through the payment of salary and pension of the european officers more significantly this reform was being advocated as a measure against racism what they demanded actually was simultaneous civil service examination both in india and london and the raising of the age limit for appearing in such examinations from 19 to 23 but charles wood the president of the board of control opposed it on the ground that there was no institution in india which could train the boys for the examination the public service commission appointed under charles h eisen recommended the raising of the maximum age but not simultaneous examination in 1892 to 1893 under the initiative of william gladstone the house of commons passed a resolution for simultaneous examination though the secretary of state was still opposed to it but at the same time the maximum age for examination was further lowered to the disadvantage of the indians soon gladstone was replaced by lord salisbury and the whole matter was buried there another sore point in this area was the military expenditure the british indian army was being used in imperial wars in all parts of the world particularly in africa and asia these and the indian frontier wars of the 1890 put a very heavy burden on the indian finances the moderates demanded that this military expenditure should be evenly shared by the british government indians should be taken into the army as volunteers and more and more of them should be appointed in higher ranks all of these demands were however rejected commander in chief roberts abhorred the idea of volunteer service as he feared that the maratha and bengali volunteers disaffected and untrustworthy as they were because of their association with nationalism would surely find their way into the army and subvert its integrity similarly the demand for appointing indians in commissioned ranks was rejected as no european officer would cherish the thought of being ordered by an indian commander the british government agreed to share only a small fraction of the military expenditure less than 1 million pounds in all the higher exchange rates reduced the amount even further and so the burden on the indian finances remained the same the other administrative demands of the moderates included the extension of trial by jury repeal of the arms act complaint against overassessment of land revenue and demand for the extension of the permanent settlement demand for the abolition of salt tax and a campaign against the exploitation of the indentured labor at the assam tea gardens all these demands represented a plea for racial equality and a concern for civil rights and also perhaps reflected a concern for the lower orders though of a very limited nature but it is needless to mention that none of the demands were even considered by the colonial administration however despite all these setbacks the most significant historical contribution of the moderates was that they offered an economic critique of colonialism this economic nationalism as it is often referred to became a major theme that developed further during the subsequent period of the nationalist movement and to a large extent influenced the economic policies of the congress government in independent india three names are important to remember in this respect dada bhai noroji a successful businessman justice mg ranade and rc dat a retired ics officer who published the economic history of india into volumes 1901 to 1903 the main thrust of this economic nationalism was on indian poverty created by the application of the classical economic theory of free trade their main argument was that british colonialism had transformed itself in the 19th century by jettisoning the older and direct modes of extraction through plunder tribute and mercantilism 
in favor of more sophisticated and less visible methods of exploitation through free trade and foreign capital investment. This turned India into a supplier of agricultural raw materials and foodstuffs to and a consumer of manufactured goods from the mother country. India was thus reduced to the status of a dependent agrarian economy and a field for British capital investment. The key to India's development was industrialization with Indian capital, while investment of foreign capital meant drainage of wealth through expatriation of profit. This drain theory was in fact the key theme of this economic nationalism. It was argued that direct drainage of wealth took place through the payment of home charges, military charges, and guaranteed interest payment on railway investments. The burden became heavier because of the falling exchange rates of rupee in the 1890 and was compounded by budget deficits, higher taxes, and military expenditure. In Noroji's calculation this huge drainage amounted to about £12 million per year, while William Digby calculated it to be £30 million. In average, this amounted to at least half of the total revenue income of the British Indian government. This directly impoverished India and stultified the process of capital formation. High land revenue demands led to land alienation and impoverishment of the peasantry, while absence of protective tariff in the interest of the British manufacturers hindered Indian industrialization and destroyed the handicraft industry. This led to overburdening of agriculture and further impoverishment. The cycle was completed in this way. Noroji calculated the per capita income of the Indians to be 20 rupees, while Digby's calculation was 18 rupees for 1899. The government did not accept this calculation. In 1882, Rippon's finance secretary calculated it to be 27 rupees, while Lord Curzon in 1901 calculated it to be 30 rupees. The famines and epidemics of this period however told a different story. To quote Dada Bhai Norozi again, materially British rule caused only impoverishment, it was like the knife of sugar. That is to say there is no oppression, it is all smooth and sweet, but it is the knife, notwithstanding. So, to rectify this situation what the moderates wanted was a change in economic policies. Their recommendations included reduction of expenditure and taxes, a reallocation of military charges, a protectionist policy to protect Indian industries, reduction of land revenue assessment, extension of permanent settlement to Ryotwari and Mahalwari areas, and encouragement of cottage industries and handicrafts. But none of these demands were fulfilled. Income tax, abolished in the 1870, was reimposed in 1886. The salt tax was raised from 2 rupees to 2.5 rupees. A customs duty was imposed, but it was matched by a countervailing excise duty on Indian cotton yarn in 1894, which was reduced to 3.5% in 1896. The Fowler Commission artificially fixed the exchange rate of rupee at a high rate of 1 shilling and 4 pence. There was no fundamental change in the agricultural sector either as colonial experts like Alfred Lyell believed that Indian agriculture had already passed through its stationary stage and had entered the modern stage of growth and hence there were more signs of progress than recession. The moderate economic agenda, like its constitutional or administrative agenda, thus remained largely unrealized. This nationalist economic theory may appear to be a contentious issue for economic historians, but construction of this economic critique of colonialism at this historical juncture had its own political and ethical significance. This economic theory by linking Indian poverty to colonialism was trying to corrode the moral authority of colonial rule, and also perhaps by implication challenging the whole concept of paternalistic imperialism or British benevolence. In this way the moderate politicians generated anger against British rule, Though because of their own weaknesses, they themselves could not convert it into an effective agitation for its overthrow. The moderate politicians could not or did not organize an agitation against British rule, because most of them still shared an intrinsic faith in the English democratic liberal political tradition. So their appeal was to the liberal political opinion in England, their method was to send prayers and petitions, to make speeches and publish articles. 
By using these tools of colonial modern public life they tried to prepare a convincing logical case aimed at persuading the liberal political opinion in England in favour of granting self-government to India. But this political strategy, which the more extremist elements in the Congress later described as a strategy of mendicancy, failed to achieve its goals. The failure of moderate politics was quite palpable by the end of the 19th century and their future was doomed as the less sympathetic Tories returned to power in Britain at the turn of the century. Nevertheless, the moderates created a political context within which such an agitation was to develop later on. There were also other contradictions in moderate politics which made it more limited and alienated from the greater mass of the Indian population. This was related to the social background of the moderate politicians who mostly belonged to the propertied classes. The first conference of the Indian National Congress in 1885 was attended by 72 non-official Indian representatives who included people belonging, as it was claimed, to most classes, such as lawyers, merchants and bankers, landowners, medical men, journalists, educationists, religious teachers and reformers. But despite the preponderance of the new professionals, the British Indian Association of the Landowners maintained a cordial relationship with the Congress for the first few initial years and remained its major source of finance. About 18.99% of the delegates who attended the Congress sessions between 1892 and 1909 were landlords, the rest were lawyers, 39.32%, traders, 15.10%, Journalists, 3.18%, doctors, 2.94%, teachers, 3.16%, and other professionals, 17.31%. Among the lawyers again many were related to landlord families or had landed interests. The Congress, therefore, could not dispense with landed aristocrats and could not consequently take a logical stand on peasant questions. They demanded extension of the permanent settlement only in the interest of the Zamindars and a post-cadastral survey in 1893-1894, though it was meant to protect the peasants from the manipulations of the Zamindars and their intriguing Amlas. The small pertinent lobby within the Congress led by R.C. Dutt was soon outmanoeuvred, as their opposition in 1898 to the Prosminder Amendment to the Bengal Tenancy Act of 1885 put them in a difficult situation. Opposition to the Punjab Land Alienation Bill in 1899 also betrayed their pro landlord sympathies. Representation of the commercial classes among its members also prevented Congress from taking a provoking class position. They were opposed to factory reforms like the Mining Bill, which proposed to improve the living condition of women and children and restrict their employment under certain age. They also opposed similar labour reforms in Bombay on the plea that they were prompted by Lancashire interests. However, they supported labour reforms for Assam tea gardens, as capitalist interest involved there was of foreign origin, happily forgetting that the Indian mill owners in Bombay exploited their labourers in no less flagrant ways. Finally, their advocacy of indigenous capitalism as a panacea for Indian poverty revealed their true colours. It was the pro-landlord and pro-bourgeois policies of the early Congress politicians that allowed the colonial government to project itself as the real protector of the poor. These early moderate politicians were also mainly Hindus, bearing the notable exception of the Bombay politician, Badruddin Tyabji. Between 1892 and 1909, nearly 90% of the delegates who attended the Congress sessions were Hindus and only 6.5% were Muslims, and among the Hindus again nearly 40% were Brahmins and the rest were upper caste Hindus. This social composition inevitably resulted in social orthodoxy, as social questions were not to be raised in the Congress sessions till 1907. More crucial however was the question of mobilizing the Muslims, as the Congress demand for elected councils was not liked by prominent Muslim leaders like Sir Syed Ahmed Khan who feared that this would mean Hindu-majority rule, the dominance of the frail-bodied Bengalis, to the disadvantage of the Muslim minority. In response to this, in its 1888 session, 
Congress passed a rule that no resolution would be accepted if an overwhelming majority of Hindu or Muslim delegates objected to it. In 1889, in its resolution demanding reform of legislatures, a clause was added recommending proportional representation of the minorities. But these symbolic gestures did not remove the apprehension of the Muslims, while the crucial silence of the Congress during the Kaukaling riots of 1893 added further to such misgivings. Congress was not directly involved in the cow protection movement, nor did it sympathize with this cause, but by speaking against it, they felt they might lose the support of the Hindu constituency. Its silence was misinterpreted, for legitimate reasons, as concurrence, and as John McLean has shown, Muslim participation in Congress sessions began to decline rather dramatically after 1893. Yet there was no major Congress endeavor to bring the Muslims back into its fold. The Congress politicians suffered from a sense of complacency as no rival Muslim political organization worth its name developed until 1906. The moderate politics thus remained quite limited in nature, in terms of its goals, programs, achievements and participation. Lord Dufferin, therefore, could easily get away with his remark at the street. Andrew's Day Dinner at Calcutta in November 1888 that Congress represented only a microscopic minority of the Indian people. Yet, despite this limited representation, the historical significance of the early Congress lay in the fact that by providing an economic critique of colonialism and by linking Indian poverty to it, the moderate politicians had constructed a discursive field within which the subsequent nationalist attack on colonialism could be conceptualized. It was because of the failures of the moderate politics that an extremist reaction was soon to develop in Congress politics to lead to what is often referred to as the notorious Surat split of 1907. The reunification of the Congress and the expansion of the political nation had to wait for the arrival of Gandhi and World War I. If you like this video so please do like, share this video and hit the subscribe button.